Welcome. Um, I'm John Jameson. I'm a front-end dev, themer, standard sort of jack-of-all-trades Drupal person for Princeton. Um, you'll find me on Slack and Drupal and things at a, it may be JJ, and when you've got my name by the second slide, just think of Jameson's Irish Whiskey. Share the name. Um, this presentation, this grew out of um, redesigning Princeton.edu this year. Uh, and we had a lot of requirements for a lot of media. We handle a lot of news content, um, all kinds of embeddables, all kinds of different size embeddables. Um, I, we had a lot of demand from our editors that they'd get a lot easier. They didn't want anything to look like IMCE. They wanted something that looked a lot friendlier, very easy to just create things on the fly, very easy to select things from a library, stick them in the page. They really wanted a real what you see is what you get experience. They didn't want a fake WYSIWYG where things looked very different. They had to hit preview and then save and then come back and edit again and come back and forth. They wanted an actual WYSIWYG experience. Um, and they wanted to be able to extend and combine things. If they uploaded a couple images, they wanted to be able to have like a nice sort of masonry cluster or a slideshow. They wanted to be able to second guess themselves and just change the cluster to a slideshow and not have to re-upload everything again to a different thing. Um, and so this meant a lot of time playing with the media module. Um, it also spent a lot of time thinking about front end performance because some of these embeds ended up being full screen on 4K screens and needing ridiculous amounts of resolution. So we spent a lot of time having to play with responsive images and lazy loading and testing that. Uh, I also wanted it to be really easy to configure. <laughs> no pony for you, it says. Um, so I, I ended up with enough stuff I learned to dump enough to fill up this thing, plus bonus slides at the end, plus a bunch of slides I threw out. So, uh, it worked. We have, uh, I think, nearly three dozen view modes in the end. Um, these are things like column width you'll see here. We also have a full page width with kind of negative margins to blow things out. We have cover images that are flexy and we have uh, floating things that are half width and a third width at desktop and might go full width at mobile or might stay at half width. And so there's a whole lot of choreography available. Um, actual size, sometimes people, especially legacy content, has images that are not high DPI and they're only 160 pixels wide. And if you stretch that to half the width of the column, it's a bad thing. So, things like that. Um, clusters, we have clusters working. A uh, whole bunch of different kinds of clusters. We ended up doing clusters where they could sort of define how they want the cluster to look rather than masonry. We've used masonry elsewhere. Mason if, if people don't know masonry, masonry is JavaScript libraries that auto-fill pictures into a nice grid like uh, Pinterest. Um, sometimes you want that, sometimes you actually want this to be the first and that to be the second. So our clusters are more the latter. Slideshows, things like that. Um, when you're working with the media module and embed, you get to just embed things right in your little in-page editor. Um, and if you right-click on it and edit it, you can pick how you want it to display. And so this list here has about a dozen options. Um, and so they can stick something in the page, look at it, change it, change it again, drag it around. So it's nice. Um, Pop-up browser, we'll talk about this later. It's just a view uh, in the new media world. Um, so we've extended ours and added a couple little bells and whistles I'll talk about to make it nice and easy to find something. And importantly, all of the, we were one of the early adopters of eight. It was a reasonably frustrating experience at times. Um, at this point, everything's pretty much stable and a lot of it's moving into core. Um, so, uh, this is cropped out of that page, this is in the deck, that, but there is a issue on, on Drupal.org where they are talking about uh, making Drupal finally out of the box work with things like images. Um, and they want 80% of use cases to become part of core. Uh, what's coming? Um, this is what we're going to talk about today. What's coming is, is the things like uh, embed and entity embed and URL embed that are the, the, all the modules it takes to be able to say, oh, I just want this Vimeo URL, and it just takes care of the rest of it and sticks in the page. The image handling, all those kinds of things. Um, entity browser, this is all coming to core. Um, so especially in the next hour, if you go to Dan Schiavone's talk, <coughs> he'll talk a lot about configuring these things today, but hopefully in time there's less configuration needed. Uh, what I'm not going to talk about, but is also coming, from what I hear, are some very cool toys, things like Drop Zone JS, Drop Zone JS, 
uh, which is one of these drag and drop boxes where you can just drag something off your desktop into the box and it'll create the Drupal entity. Uh, all the cropping API things, if you want to crop on the fly. Fallback formatter is a cool toy. <coughs> so you just paste in a URL to Vimeo and it looks at it and says, oh, that's a Vimeo. You mean you want to create a Vimeo bundle. Or it sort of hands it off to the right kind of media. Cool toy. It helps. Um, if you're doing it now, um, this is what we'll be talking about. Um, things that aren't yet in core, although my little side note there is media entity just appeared in core in 8.4. I haven't tested it yet, so hmm. test it. But um, it's coming. So media entity. How many here have actually configured media from base? OK, good. So I'm on show you right. Review for five minutes, and then we'll uh, move forward. Media entity is the basic brain of this whole media world. It defines something like a node for a file. Um, so that's the thing that actually instantiates the ability to say, I want to create an image kind of bundle or a video kind of bundle, and I want to add fields to it. So that's, that's we'll call it the API. Um, entity embed is the module that connects that to your little WYSIWYG system so you can have a little embed button that pops up the browser and lets you stick things in. Uh, entity browser is what creates the browser. It's going to ask you for C tools. Um, and then what's going to happen is you're going to end up with a whole bunch of type providers. Type providers um, are things like image or video. And this just tells media entity um, how to create a field of the right kind. And it creates the HTML output. Um, so these tend to be very small little modules that are very much what you'd expect and labeled accordingly. Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. Um, Drupal.org slash project slash media entity has a nice list of these and you just download the ones you want. You're good to go. Let's make one. So once you have those installed, you'll clear cache. That's a theme. Just say clear cache after every slide for the next hour. Um, once your cache is cleared, if you go up to structure under manage, you'll see on your list of structure things you can play with, media bundles appears. Let's add one. Add a media bundle. Label, image, description, be nice to your editors, uh, a type. And you'll see it doesn't say much. It says generic media and image. Why? Because I haven't turned on a whole bunch of type providers yet. Every type provider is going to add another option. Uh, and type provider fields, some of those type providers are going to come with lots of extra options. We'll, show, we'll see some later. Let's make an image, call it an image, hit save. You land on your Manage Fields page, and you have no fields. So you've created a bundle of type image, but it doesn't actually have any way to put an image in it. Add a field. Here's your, all your fields you can add. Uh, there's, you can reference an image file. If you've installed the video provider, you'll see video. That media list will fill up as you add type providers. And that's the thing that actually creates that browse and upload field. You can pick any number of values. If you're just creating an ability to add an image, you probably want one. If you're doing a slideshow, you might want unlimited. Save. And then you can add more fields. So you're just fielding this out like it's another content type. So caption, often. Uh, maybe an image credit, byline. Um, maybe a link. You want to wrap a link around the image or put a link at the end of the caption. Whatever you want. You can just field these things out. Um, this is ours as a real example. We have a caption field. We have a credit field. It points at a taxonomy. So we have a whole list of all of the photographers on campus. Um, but we also have a freeform credit field. So we want to control that. We don't want someone misspelling the name of a photographer we know. But we get all kinds of ad hoc things, say courtesy of MoMA, or courtesy of this, or courtesy of that. And we just didn't want that cluttering up our taxonomy. So we created two different credit fields. Your mileage may vary. Um, we have a credit prefix field, photo by, video by, courtesy of, things like that, uh, and our actual image. And then you do it again for your next media type. So you do this a lot if you have a whole bunch. Uh, if you install video embed media, um, sorry, video embed field, which is the video provider, you get this nice ability to create a video bundle. Except you won't be able to stick it in anything because it has a sub-module called Video Embed Media, which makes this field work with media. So just make sure you enable that 
or you'll wonder why you don't have a video embed in the list. That's why. So go into your modules, turn it all on, good to go. There it is. Adds to that type provider field we saw earlier when you want to create a new bundle type. And then some extended. So video embed field. I'm saying sometimes some providers create new options for, um, for all kinds of types. So it comes with the ability to Vimeo and YouTube. And then it might have additional providers where you can extend the video embed field with other providers of external videos. Um, so the video embed field project has its own list of additional things if you want um, Meta Cafe or whatever cool kids are using these days. Um, and there you go, do all again. So this is our video uh, bundle. We have one more field beyond image called uh, cover image. So our videos have an image. And you load the page and what you see, you don't see the, the Vimeo embed immediately. You just see this image with a play button on it. And when you click it, our JavaScript says, throw out that image, and now Vimeo can load. And Because when we started testing, we were finding our performance was terrible. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. And what we found was the Princeton homepage was freezing on load while the browsers were going out to pull the Vimeo JavaScript API. So now that doesn't load until someone actually tries to play a video. So you might want to do something if you like that. Uh, we have a lot of bundles. So we image, video, Facebook post, document, um, Instagram, tweet, things like that. Local MP3s, local MP4s. I think Dan's going to talk about that more in the next session. Um, as a couple of just saying here, I'm going to exit the beginner stuff. If it's your first time doing this, at the end of my deck is some more slides on configuring the basics. If we have time at the end, we might go through them, but otherwise, read it through. Um, let's theme. So, you have a bundle. What's it look like? Well, what it looks like is a whole bunch of fields barfed onto the page. If you create this bundle and embed it in something, what you're going to see is um, the media name, the date it was created, the publisher, author, uh, a thumbnail, and the URL of the video. That's probably not your intention. So, disable everything. All you want is that actual image or video, things like that. Drag it all into disabled. I'm in the, the manage fields in the bundle, just like manage fields in a content type here. And so now you embed it and you just see your little object. Um, and if you turn on your inspector in your browser, what you're going to see is your base theme probably knows about media, and your base theme is probably already wrapped in a whole bunch of helpful classes. So if you're using Classy, um, it probably has a wrapper class of media, probably has a wrapper class of media dash the bundle's machine name. It probably has something that says view mode dash um, the machine name of the view mode. So you have a whole lot of things here that give you all you need. You might be done. Now you can just go to CSS. Um, if you target the bundle, you'll target all of its different view modes. If you target the view mode, you'll target all bundles that use that view mode. So that's very handy. So if we say, you know, left half is going to be floating left at half width, that hits image and that hits Instagram and that hits video and that hits everything. Um, but if we say I have just video, it's just going to hold the videos and everything. It's nice. You might want more than that. We wanted a lot more than that. So I'm going to show you a little twig here. Um, if you haven't played with twig before in Drupal 8, all of the theming can be done in twig. It it's, looks a lot like HTML. It's surprisingly not scary if you're new at it. Uh, but it's completely optional. If you were happy with that markup, you're done. Skip the next three minutes, check Facebook. Um, so what you would do, you'd go find your base theme in the file system. Um, and in your base theme, there's going to be a file called media.html.twig. Uh, it might be under core theme stable templates, core themes classy templates, core th whatever you're using, it's there somewhere. Find your base theme, find this. Um, it looks like this. Um, I think I, yes, good. So it has a whole bunch of helpful comments. Um, if you've taken some theming trainings, you'll recognize a lot of what's going on there. But it's going to tell you things like what variables are available. Um, it's going to have this array set classes. This is all the CSS classes it's generating. Um, and you can just hit enter, add a comma, and add, you know, this is my pretty view mode or whatever. Um, so you can add more CSS classes. And then you just have um, 
a little bit of HTML, article, add those classes. Uh, if there's content, dump the content. Um, so you can now just copy that thing, paste it into your own theme. Um, so we have a folder in our theme called media, just because we have so many templates, we organize them. You could just dump them all in the templates folder in your theme. Um, and rename it. So you want to name it media, not just media.html.twig, because that's going to change every media item in your entire site. So what you want is media hyphen hyphen the machine name of your bundle. Or media hyphen hyphen the machine name of your bundle hyphen hyphen the machine name of your view mode. And so it ends up looking like media image page width, media image slideshow, media local audio, media video. Um, and now that will only apply to that particular kind of thing. Clear cache. Um, so a real example, real example. So uh, outlined in pink here, you'll see this is the div structure we wanted. It's not what we were getting. We wanted, um, we wanted our caption under our images um, on mobile, and we wanted them thrown out into the sidebar column uh, on desktop. So we basically wanted, we wanted a separate container around all of these fields. So, looking at that twig file, before it just said article, content, brace, brace, content, and twig is saying dump the contents of whatever is in content. Um, we can just start writing HTML. So I've just written in div class image caption, div class image byline. I've stuck my containers in just the way I want it, just writing HTML. Um, and then it said brace, brace, content, which meant dump all the content. Well, I want to break the content up. So in Twig, you can say content dot fields machine name. And you can just output one field at a time. And so I've said in image caption, dump out content of field media caption. And in image byline, dump out content field byline prefix and dump out content field byline. And so I can just go one at a time, put it wherever I want in the markup, all done. One trick that you will learn the hard way, well you won't because you're here, yay. Um, if you start playing with this, there's a whole bunch of secret sauce of the cache tags that tell Drupal when this person edits this media, clear the cache for any nodes it's embedded in. If you just do the four fields as those machine names, you actually don't end up printing the cache tags out. And so when you change your image, it doesn't change on the page. Um, the way you get around that is there's a little thing pipe without in the twig world. So content without the list of all the other fields means print out the one field I didn't list here and everything else I didn't explicitly exclude. And so that basically means content.image. But it means content.image and anything I don't know about. So that gets you all your cache tags for free and you don't have to learn anything about the caching system. I don't know anything about the caching system. If someone wants to present on it, I'd love to learn. You can also very quickly learn how to do some basic logic in place. Um, Twig.symphony.com has this documentation. So in our case, we have this little prefix, photo by. Well, if the editor, the default is photo by, if there's no byline, we're gonna end up with photo by nothing on the page. No one wants that. So I wanna say, only print this if there's actually some more than one or two characters in the byline. I did that because sometimes people end up with a space or something, and this is just a very crude way of getting around that. So I say, if the content of field byline has a length of more than two, then dump out the prefix, otherwise don't. That's all the work it takes to have a little custom div and a little bit of if statements. Um, and it looks a lot like HTML. It's well documented. So that's how you theme a bundle. I'm going to keep just running through. I'm showing you a little bit of everything. Let's bundle a bundle in a bundle. So we said we wanted this little masonry thing. So this means we have a couple more complicated goals now. Now we want to have little numbers. One, two, three. One, two, three over there. But so now it's in a different container. But it's not only a different container. We need to actually stick numbers on it. Um, we need more than one media item in its bundle. Uh, so we're going to go add a new bundle structure media bundles, add a bundle. 
Here we are back in. We called ours Slides. The machine name is Group because we keep changing what we want to call it. <laughs> it's a group of other media names. We are using the Slideshow type provider. I'm not making a Slideshow. But the type provider for Slideshows is really good at saying, oh, there's multiple media items in here. Let's pick a thumbnail from one of them or something like that. So that sometimes you can misuse a type provider in this way that's really handy. Um, has one field. There's no caption. There's no byline. Um, has one field and it's insert another media item. So we have a bundle in a bundle. And then because I'm inserting a media item, it says, well, what kind of media items do you want to reference? Um, image, video, video local. Not checked here, Facebook and Instagram. Why? Because I haven't themed that yet. It doesn't work in this yet. I can come back and turn it on later. Back to Twig. So I now have this bundle. It can reference another media item. So you go create that one first. You create an image, you create five images. You create five images in a video. Then you can create this new group. And you can just drag in all of those things you've created and make this, this grouping. So I have a new Twig file. Well now, I want to create those little one, two, three, four, fives. And so in Twig, you can also do a for loop. So, and <clears throat> you can copy this on Stack Overflow. Um, so I want to just walk through this field multiple times. So I'm going to say four key items, that's a syntax, in the content field group media, as long as it isn't garbage. Then dump out my own little div with the class that I want, and dump out another div of counter, key plus one item. And so this is going to give me a little a little box called counter with a number in it inside the container with my image. And then in the captions, rather than just having that little sidebar container like we had in the previous Twig file, now I copy that in again, do the same thing with the counter. So I have the same counter matching the, the uh, caption and the image. Um, and then this is just a little tweak. Um, so Twig Tweaks is, a, is this wonderful shortcut module that lets you do all kinds of stupid things. And there's lots of good documentation on the project page. Um, basically, I could do each field again here. Or I can have another view mode on my image called just caption and credit, which is all of the fields minus the image. And Twig Tweaks will let you, in your theme, call a different view mode. So I'm saying, hey, Twig Tweaks module, dump out, according to your documentation for Drupal Entity, a media item of the ID of my media item uh, in this different view mode, caption and credit. And so rather than having to print out every single field, it just goes boink and dumps in a different view mode for that same image that's just the caption. Um, it works. That's what I just said. <laughs> so the one trick here is you would have to find the ID of your media. Um, so that involves using the Kint module. That is a whole different presentation Find me the after party if you want to know about that. I'll tell you all about it, but that's an hour of time. Um, so, images in one container, captions in the other. Um, for our purposes, at that point, we just did CSS. We could do masonry. Um, but point is, so now we have our little floating images. Um, change the view mode, you can have completely different CSS. I'm targeting the CSS of that wrapper. Um, which means, if you take that same entity, this is the WYSIWYG editor. I can right click it, say edit entity, and I can just change it from um, a cluster to a slideshow. I don't have to go back to the media item and change anything. Slideshow. So that now hits a different Twig file. It doesn't have to, but our theme then, we have a JavaScript library for slideshows, and so it knows to look for these classes, and it just works. I should be. We're going to finish on time. All right. So that is, that's the basis of creating these, these items. And this is a little sort of love your editors moment. Um, in the media world, you're now working a lot inside CK Editor. And CK Editor doesn't know about your front end theme. And so we've done all of this Twig stuff. Well, when you put it in the embed editor, you're just going to see an image dumped on the page. Um, you've lost all your Twig. You've lost all your CSS. So that's frustrating. Um, it can also be a little hard to grab and edit. It's hard, it's goofy. And then the perennial problem 
if you are being accessible, which most of you are legally required to be accessible, uh, and it's a good thing, um, that layer is often invisible to site editors. Your content editors are creating images. Um, they may or may not fill out an alt element, um, and they'll never know if they filled it out well. So we're going to talk a little about that. Um, so, in your theme, whether you know about it or not, there is a file called the name of your theme.info.yaml. <coughs> if you find that file in your file system, it's open your theme folder, you can add these two lines. Um, CK editor underscore style sheets. And that means, hey front end theme, inject into CK editor whatever CSS files follow this line. Um, so for us, you can say, say CSS slash my back end stuff. Um, you could actually in that line say CK editor style sheets, my entire front end theme. And it would inject your, all of your CSS into CK editor. That actually works fine. Um, you might get some weirdness if you have like overlapping styles with some CK editor stuff. It's also very heavy, but you could stop now. Check Facebook. Um, you can also, if you're using SAS, um, compile a subset um, or just by hand. So in our case, we have, um, we're using SAS to compile um, all this stuff. And so we have this huge include list of all of these little CSS files that we, we group together. We've just made a copy of that and it just walks that list. Um, and for the admin theme, I've just commented out um, any style sheet that's for the header or the footer or the menu and things like that. So you end up with something much more lightly. Um, I'll go back a step just to say um, this is more inside baseball. But if you're doing that, um, just know that in your gulp file, you can have a, common, a comma separated list of multiple compiles. I didn't know that, so just look that up. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, so that works for the CSS, but you don't get any of your twig. So we changed all our twig files. So now um, you have all your CSS, but all the container's names are wrong if you did any of those twig tweaks. Um, so just make sure if you have a templates folder of media items in your front end theme and you have a different admin theme, copy that folder, paste it into your admin theme, clear cache. Um, if it works, you will now have a perfect uh, front end, back end experience. Um, with the exception that you're limited to the width of the little edit box, so it's gonna be like the mobile breakpoint to some level, but, uh, but that's, that's our front end, that's our back end. It's a good thing. Um, you can also then start to play with the CSS. So when we got into the media world, if you clicked on a media item in CK Editor, there was no indication it was selected. Um, and having it selected changes a bunch of things. So the, the embed button to embed new media becomes uh, edit the currently selected media. But there was just no visual feedback that was happening. Um, and so we added this nice big juicy border and a padding and it shrinks a little. And, um, and we've kept it because when it's floating, uh, just as a bit of an accident of the way the containers are, this orange actually draws a single orange line off to the left. So you can actually see where it's sitting in the, uh, in the structure. But just to say, you can now start to, to theme things in C category. Um, another little world here. So say I, I do click on that edit embed, and it pops up this little embed media edit embed where I can change, uh, I can uh, go to the selected entity, remove it, whatever. Um, well, if I click that, it doesn't actually go to edit the video. Say I want to change the caption. You can't get there. You have to click on this, it takes you to the node, then you have to edit that node and do this whole dance. Um, so, let's play a little bit, if you want to play with media's JavaScript. Um, if you've never seen libraries override, this is another one that's like, eh, we're getting the grand tour. Um, in your my ad, uh, admin theme.info.yaml, it exists in your admin theme. Um, just like we put in the, um, the CK editor line, you can add a line that says libraries override. And that means I'm going to list two libraries. So in the Drupal 8 world, uh, if you have a module and it has a bunch of CSS and JavaScript, it has what's called a library. And it's, it's that module's library that's JavaScript and CSS. You can just tell your theme to tell that module to drop it and replace it with your local library. So I can say libraries override entity embed 
Drupal Entity Embed Dialog. How did I know that? I just went rooting around Entity Embed and said, where is this silly thing coming from that doesn't have an edit button? Um, I found the file, I found there was a library, so I copy that in and I just say, you know, instead, stick in the my admin theme library. Well, where's that coming from? In my admin theme dot libraries dot yaml. It exists. Look in your admin theme. Um, and I can add this line. I can say entity embed. That's whatever I want. That's just the name of my new library. And in there I want for JavaScript, this JavaScript file I'm going to create. And I want for CSS, this back reference back to the entity embed module because I still want their CSS. I'm only overriding a little bit. Uh, and it's going to need jQuery. That's coming. So basically what I've just taken is I've taken their library, pasted it into my admin theme, and changed one line because I want my JavaScript instead. Um, and what's my JavaScript? My JavaScript's their JavaScript. I've copied and pasted it into my admin theme um, because all I want to do is change this line. This is the wrong way to do it. Anybody here that, that is better at PHP uh, is crying right now because I, I should be modifying the form and doing hook form alters. But if you're new to all this, the wrong way is a really good way to learn how some pieces work. It's easy. Um, so I have their JavaScript. And I'm just adding one line that says, you know, when you make this little link, add slash edit to the end of it. It's the wrong way, but it works great. Now I have an edit button. It's crude. But point being, any of these things you're bringing in, if you explore them, you're going to find they have libraries, they come with markup, they come with um, the type providers are going to have their own twig files. You can copy them in. We've overridden a lot of them. That's how we did the cover image for, uh, for the videos. We just copied out the media's, uh, media videos template, changed it. So get brave about that. Another example. Um, so that little pop-up browser you have, it's just a view now. Um, so you can just edit that view. So we wanted to make it really obvious if someone had messed up alt elements. And we wanted to make it obvious to everyone else because shame is a great motivator. Um, and if we just had the alt element sort of exposed in the story, then only that story's author would see it. But this way, anyone browsing for media is going to be able to be sort of ambiently trained that they need to remember their alt elements and write good alt elements. So we edit this view. Um, and then you'll see here there's some red text. So in our view, go to views, you'll see there's this media view. It comes with it. It's creating that, that there's going to be a media page in your content tab. It's going to be your browsers. We edit that view. And in the field we've added for alt element, if you have ever played with views, you have the option to rewrite in place the output of a field. It has a little rewrite checkbox. Um, Inside that blank box, you can paste in twig. And so we've written a little HTML. It says, add a line break, add an M, add brace, brace, image, underscore, underscore, alt, the field name we're playing with. And then we have a little inline if statement. If the word photo appears in image alt, because a screen reader, if you don't know, when it hits an image and reads the alt tag, says image, and then reads the content of the alt element. So if they've written image of students, it's going to say image, image of students. It's annoying. And so we're saying, hey, if, if it says photo or if it says image, write out suspicious text and put it in red. Um, I'm not blocking them from doing this because sometimes it should be there. Sometimes the actual thing, this is an artistic photo of something, and so it should be there. But it just says, hey, hey, look at this. Did you mean to do that? Um, and if, if its length is less than one, I find that terribly suspicious. So it says alternative text missing. But I'm not going to prevent them from doing it because they might mean for it to be blank. Because blank means screen reader ignore this image. Sometimes that's what they want. All right. So places to look for things when you use solve problems. Responsive images. So we said at the beginning, we have um, this big full width image. Um, if you hit our homepage on desktop, there is 1.3 megabytes of images. Uh, if you're on mobile, there's 0.3. That's a big difference. Um, and so that comes from this um, responsive images module. Um, how many people have ever seen the markup for HTML5 responsive images? Good. OK, I'll keep talking. Um, all your hands went up. I'd skip some slides. Um, 
So in the old world, you'd say image, source equals file name. You're done. Um, with responsive images, you get what's a, called a source set. Um, and a source set is a list of file names. Uh, your little image, your medium image, your big image. And after each file name is the width of the file in pixels. So this file is a 640 pixel wide image. This is a 960 pixel wide image. And then you see a sizes attribute. And the sizes attribute says, hey browser, the CSS is going to tell you at some point when you finish downloading the CSS that this image is going to be 90 VW units. VW is, each VW is 1% of your viewport width. Not your container width, the whole window. And so it says it's going to be 90% of the viewport width unless you're a tablet. And then it's going to be 45% of the viewport width because it's going to start floating. Unless you're a really big desktop and we're going to go to a multi-column layout and it's going to be 26% of the viewport width. And then it says, hey, if you're a stupid browser that doesn't understand any of this, just go get that image. It'll be good enough. So where does all that come from? Um, you don't want to write that by hand. So Drupal has a responsive images module. It's now coming into core. Um, but you're going to have to tell it about your theme. You're going to have to tell it where your breakpoints are. You're going to have to tell it for each view mode, the choreography, how big is this going to be at various moments. So let's go get it. It comes with core. 80% is moving into core, but it's not turned on. Turn it on. So extend, find responsive image, check the box. Clear cache. Um, now you'll see under, um, <coughs> under your configuration tab, you'll see responsive image styles appears. It comes with two starter styles. These aren't going to be very helpful to you. They don't know about your breakpoints. They don't know about anything. They'll, they'll help you open them up, look around, see what's in there. But you're going to need to add some. So I'm going to click add a style. Um, it says, OK. So it has a field for sizes. And this is where you're just going to write, look up the syntax, but it, it's here. Um, you're going to write you know, min width, 1290px, whatever your breakpoint is. The width, min width, that. So that's, that's for this particular responsive view mode in this particular place. They'll just say this is like half width the desktop and whatever. You're just going to write in what your theme is going to do with it. And then it's going to give you a list of the image styles that you've already created, what, what, what file sizes are available. And you'll just check off any that seem relevant. Um, so save. You go back to your media bundle. Go to image, and there's this image field, manage display, format, change the format from image to responsive image. And so now rather than just spitting out one image, it's going to spit out all that markup for you. You don't have to think about it again. How do you know if it's working? Um, if you're in a good browser and you right click and inspect and open up the web inspector, um, there is a network tab on that inspector. That network tab lets you disable cache. It also lets you see what's being downloaded. And so you can say, just show me those images. So you can just take your browser, <coughs> disable the cache, resize it down to the size of a mobile browser, refresh, and you'll see, bonk, an image fills in, and it should be teeny. And expand the window, and you should just see, dink, 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 dink. Your images should just appear at the right moment. So the browser is just, it now it knows how big it should be, and it's just pulling the right file that's the right fit. It might be high DPI, it might be low DPI. You don't care, you don't have to think about any of this. The browser takes care of all of it. Re-enable cache. Um, this can get crazy. This is crazy for us. We have a whole bunch of different, um, because it isn't just now half-width images. If you have an image that stays half-width, that's one, but if it goes full-width at mobile, that's another. Um, it can get nuts. We have 32 different image styles. Um, we have 21 different responsive image styles. So it, this can get out of hand. It's nice to have to think ahead about it a little bit. It doesn't have to get crazy. I mean, if you just have full width and half width, you're going to have like three and two. But just be warned. Um, so yes, half window width is one for us. Half column width. Half column width on desktop, full width on mobile, 16 by 9 crop, half window width, 16 by 9 crop, half window width, 16. 
That's just half, and we have six. Um, it's not complicated, it's just a lot of button clicking. Save time on your project estimate. Um, bah, 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 bah. Yeah, so we'll pick two to six. Um, naming conventions. If you do think it's going to get out of hand, think ahead about how you're going to name these things. Um, so what we ended up with, better or for worse, I'll tell you in four years if this worked out, but our image styles are named um, by whether they're scaling or cropping and by their actual width. So when we're on that responsive images thing, we can see which image style is relevant without having to go back and look at it. And you're like, oh, that's a 1920, oh, that's an 800. If I named it narrow and I named it wide and I have 26 of these things, I'm going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So a nice naming scheme. Our responsive image styles are, are very wordy, but they kind of have to be. So it's like one third content column, full that small. Um, the machine names, this, you could use this here too. If you're using like a bootstrappy, any sort of grid layout, our machine names are, are the number of, of grid columns that it's going to take at every break one. Do you factor in uh, the Deep. retina stuff at all? You don't have to think about retina. Because okay. the browser knows about retina. Yeah. Um, so the browser knows it's 100% of the viewport. Width. So retina, high DPI screens, so a 1024 screen that's actually 2048. I'm just telling the browser that this file is going to be the full width of the screen. The browser knows if it's high DPI or not. I don't care. So as long as I've given it a big image style, I'm good. But yeah, we do have a bigger okay. image so, style. Okay. So your yeah, you do want a big like file a available. Uh -huh. Yes. So deep breath. So it's not particularly complicated. Once you've done the first one, you'll be like, OK, I just need to keep doing this. Um, but it'll take a day or two. Um, two final notes. Um, if you're thinking high DPI 4K, it's 3840. Um, yeah, that didn't work. We're on Aqueous Cloud, big enterprise platform. The, it, the server ran out of RAM in testing before we even had any users, one user in the system. And so what we'd find is they were just randomly missing image styles. We'd upload the image, the first person would hit the page and just wouldn't fill in. And, and it had like filled in four of the five, but the 3841 just, it just ran out of memory and, and bailed. Um, so 2880 is our biggest style. I mean, play around. You don't need to go crazy. Even 1920 looks good. Um, last thing, we were crashing iPads at launch. We couldn't figure out why, and what we figured out is the, the um, older iPads, um, uh, I, I have an issue with Safari, um, <laughs> the older iPads in Safari were like, hey, I'm Retina, give me your biggest image style. Wow, that is big, I'm just going to crash. <laughs> um, and, and so what we found is we knew that they were 2048, and if we had an image style that was exactly 2048, they would take it. Um, because the browser takes essentially the next biggest. So if it was 2047 and 2880, it would say, well, I'm 2048. That's more than 2047. Give me the big one. Oops. Gone. Um, so this is only an issue if you have something huge. If you only go up to 2048, it's fine. But if you do want to support big 4K monitors, give the iPads a fallback for another year or two. All right. Be time for a little more magic. Lazy loading. Um, lazy loading sounds fun. Sounds like a great idea. Um, so say I have a whole bunch of images on a page, and they're big and heavy. And I've, I've done the mobile thing, so they're a little smaller, but that's still a third of a meg of images. Could I really defer that loading until they start scrolling, especially if it's a long page? Um, well, sounds great. Um, and it does save a lot of bandwidth. I mean, if someone lands on, your, on the page and doesn't scroll and move on, they never download the rest of the images. Um, but what we found in practice was the users that appreciate this most are users on slow, high latency connections. But it's actually much more annoying for them to wait 10 seconds for the page to load, and then every time they scroll, have to wait 10 seconds for a piece to load, than it is for them to have to wait 60 seconds for the page to load and be able to just scroll. And so do your testing. Um, it it um, sometimes doesn't help you. What we found in the end, after we tested a lot, is it, it really did make a, a positive experience improvement for the big images at the bottom of the big page. You know, if you have a big, big image down by your footer, that might be a place where it would make sense. Um, it makes a big difference for dynamically loaded content. There's no reason to preload images that are only going to get there if someone clicks a button, things like that. Um, but we found if the image was only about one screen down, we were much better off just leaving it the way it was and not messing with anything. Um, and we found lots of small images were a problem because the latency back and forth. If you're having JavaScript create a new request for each image, rather than it requesting them all at once at the beginning of the page load, each back and forth. I mean, especially if someone's, say, browsing from China, and the latency might be 10, 30 seconds on each trip, 
um, and you have, say, 24 images, you're going to separately lazy load in JavaScript. It's a disaster. Don't do it. Um, so um, there's a Drupal module. There's a module for that. Uh, Blazy. Be lazy. There's a JavaScript library. It implements it. Um, if you download that module and stick it in there, um, it has a configuration screen. It has a checkbox to say support responsive image. If you're using responsive images, you need to check that. Um, it has an option to load invisible. So if you have, say, a slideshow, the slides are invisible, it could preload them. Uh, if it doesn't, you'll have to tell it to. I'll tell you how to do that. Um, and it has an offset. So how many pixels away from the top of the screen should the image be before it starts loading it? And you can play with that. Um, save it. And now, if you go back to your bundle, bundles of bundles of bundles, um, your image bundle now has another format. So we went from image to responsive image, and now we'll go to Blazy. And you go to Blazy formatter, and the Blazy formatter opens this. And that says, OK, so I'm just going to wrap my Blazy magic around something. What do you want me to wrap it around? And now you're back to saying, oh, well, either an image style or responsive image style. So there's no more things to do. Blazy just takes care of the rest. It's lovely. So I've said, I just went, changed it from, that was my responsive image style. I changed to Blazy. And then I said, Blazy, use the responsive image style that was here a moment ago. Hit save, bear cache. Um, again, you want to know, did that actually work? Because if you're sitting at work on this wonderful LAN connection, you have no idea if this is working. You hit the page, everything's there. Um, it loads faster than you can see it. Um, and so we open up our, we right click, inspect the page, open up your web developer toolbar again, go back to that network tab, and all the way at the end of the network tab, is a throttling dropdown. And this will have the browser simulate a lame connection. Um, and so it, it comes with fast 3G, slow 3G, even add something that's like, you know, really slow and it just says how many like kilobits a minute do you want, whatever. Um, set it to slow 3G, set it to make it do something. Anyway, slow down your browser, make sure to come back and turn this off when you're done or the rest of your day is gonna be very slow. Um, and now when you hit the page and start scrolling down, you'll, you'll catch up with Blazy. And you should see things spinning for a while and filling it in. If you slow it down enough, you'll have time. I have, I have um, a custom throttle or that's like one byte a second. Um, because if I set it to off, then Blazy like, detects that you've lost your connection and, and bails. So I just have an incredibly slow thing. And that lets you actually inspect it and see that Blazy has stuck its own markup in the page. And that has some pretty intuitive classes, like media is currently loading. Um, and so once you see that, you can just CSS, put a little style, put a little animation preloader, give a little background. Maybe put a hint in there, like I have here um, on a couple places. Um, I, have, I have content where the image is actually setting the height of the container. And so if you have Blazy handling the image, well, the height of the container is zero pixels until the image arrives. This little page starts jumping all up and down. So you can just say, hey, in this part of my theme, um, while the media is loading for Blazy, the hint is it's going to be about this aspect ratio. Good times, almost done. Last thing, I think. Um, <laughs> Blazy um, is well documented. It's a JavaScript library. You can call it yourself. So for me, I have it not set to load invisible. Um, but we have some dynamic content where you change something and the new content f comes in. Well, the page is already loaded. So Blazy doesn't know about that content. So if I want that content to lazy load, um, you don't have to. But if you want it, um, you can in your theme say bear blazy equals new blazy blazy load this thingy um, and that's all it takes and that just says hey blazy reinitialize go look for new content deep breath okay so that's sort of tips and tricks I found I have a couple Easter egg slides that I can go after this but I'm gonna stop for questions and stretching yes so we do the lazy load and you deliver is there any way of detecting, like, so I might have a really awesome new iPhone, but I might be on a crappy connection. Is it going to select really awesome high quality images, which are then only going to further exacerbate that I have a really cool phone with a crappy connection? Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and this is the problem. So, the question is um, you, have, you might have a really great device with a really high DPI screen on a terrible connection. Um, and so, if we, have these, if we have lazy loading and responsive images and all this worked out, and the device would be much better off with the smallest image that gets delivered really quick. Uh, what's the device going to do? The device is going to pick the biggest image. 
Um, and this is just a problem in the HTML5 spec for responsive images right now. Um, you can play with that in the JavaScript world if you were to try to detect the connection speed and override things, but we're just not. It's just a problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when I was start, first digging into media and Drupal 8, um, I looked to uh, Lightning and Thunder mm -hmm. for their implementations. And from that, I built like a reusable, I mean, think of it as like a sandbox module that mm -hmm. I can pull in that I call uh, Media Essentials that I can pull in any new project I'm working on. And that works for me, but right now, there's a couple of caveats because it's not using Drupal 8 core media because um, there's still some problems in the contrib space around that. So the integration is not quite there, but my question for you is, are you familiar with other ways of doing that? Because the initial, like, it takes a lot of time to do all that initial configuration, but it doesn't need to. It's just that I don't know who's stepping up to fill in that gap other than, so I guess it's a question to you and to the room. If, people it, know. It, if I any chance, is that the Media Essentials module that was mentioned in the early slide, or is that a different module? Uh, I didn't That's your own tool. Okay. Well, I didn't mention it, but there was some. There was some. It's some of the media, actual media documentation. They talk about there being media essentials coming. I just didn't know if that was you or if that was a different. Oh, thing. I don't know. Oh, okay. I doubt Probably. it. But if you don't know, it's a different thing. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so I don't know. I don't know. I think is the answer. I mean, I think that's a question for the media team. So I mean, the question is, you know, we had to do all this crazy config. Why do we have to do all this crazy config? I really hope that someday. Um, the basic things come pre-configured, the entity browser and the, the things like that. I think said 8.6 yeah. is the target. So um, if you haven't here. hung out on Slack, you know, there's a media channel. Yeah. Um, I hope that's where it goes. For, I mean, for our purposes, in, because there's this whole configuration management system in Drupal 8, you can go to your configuration tab and export configuration, and it just exports a whole bunch of files that you can then drag in somewhere else. So the next time I have to do this, I might just end up dragging part of the configuration. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work. Don't do it. <laughs> well, no, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There are caveats for that. There are caveats for that. Yeah. yeah. And I love the, the fact that you used the slideshow to render something that wasn't a slideshow. Yes. So, how does your like person who's managing this content know to? Okay. Well, we want to have your what you call it, what your base rate, which is late. Yep. To do that. That's my question. So it's like, it, it, we didn't. Um, that's why I said. Is, uh, so we have um, the name for the thing doesn't have to match the type provider. Got it. So yeah. So the editor never sees that I'm using the slideshow provider for the cluster. They just see make a new cluster. We call it slides because we're sort of. But it, when we called a group at the beginning, that's why the machine name doesn't match. So, um, but sometimes it is a slideshow. One of the view modes for that is the slideshow. So it, it goes back. Yeah. Um, maybe one more, and then. Yeah, two more. Do you handle cropping with this setup? Do you guys do cropping at all? Let's go to the next slide. Um, <laughs> um, so we're not doing the crop API. Um, Dan Dan Schivone in the next, he has a session. I think he's going to talk about that. Okay. We're just not, um, except for one case, which is this, um, which I'll talk about. I'll get your, so I'm going to bookmark that for one second, get the last question, and then I'll talk okay. to him. So you had updated and customized and added your custom toy templates and library regrets to the end. What do you have in place to deal with um, the upgrade pass in case the end It's the wrong way to do it. Um, if it breaks, I, I would I would back that out. Um, so th there's a better way to do that. But, um, but because the only thing I'm overriding is a very small JavaScript file that basically says pop up a dialog, I'm not worried that that's going to change. And it doesn't have any under the hood logic. It's like, I know no one's going to corrupt any data. Um, it's like the pop-up might not pop up when we test it. So um, I wouldn't do that on a module that was writing to the database. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So cropping. Um, I'm not going to talk, there is the whole cropping API I'm talking about. But at least in our theme, we have a couple places where we do um, crop images. We have cropped image styles. But we don't have any of the magic in place yet that lets the editor say, crop to this part of the image. So it's just going to get cropped towards the center to some degree. Um, but our editors find that annoying, obviously not. Um, so one just interesting trick we did, where we just did a, wanted to have very simple, this is the big cover image at the top of the news story. You'll see some news stories now have a big image right at the top. We have one of these big images. 
um, and it's a 16 by 9 image, but sometimes it's like 21 by 9. Sometimes it's, it can get quite narrow because we're letting the aspect ratio of the browser affect the aspect ratio of the image because we're trying to keep the headline visible. Um, and so just one, when we talk about sort of playing with your own admin theme, um, so we just have a single field in the news article that says, should the cover be cropped to the top, middle, or bottom? Which is a very crude way to do um, what the crop API can do. Um, but it, it kept a lot of complexity out of it. Um, and as they change this, they, they see this panel which shows them the worst case scenario in both directions. Um, how tall it can be and how wide it can be. And they love this. Um, and so what we have is a little JavaScript that you're happy to steal um, in our admin theme that basically says, um, you know, when you see this field change in an edit form, uh, change the class of its container. Um, you don't need to read, that's, that's all it's doing. Uh, and then we just have a whole bunch of CSS. And the CSS just puts a before and an after in. And the before is the top, the after is the bottom. It looks at the, si at the uh, class on the container and just uses the uh, CSS transitions to nicely animate it up and down. Um, and so if you just need to do something very simple, this is a very simple way to do it, steal my code and enjoy. If you need to do something fancier, look up the crop API because it, it has some um, really cool things you can do. Um, last one and I'll, yeah. I just want to say on that that um, focal point is great. Yes. That focal point lets you set the target exactly. of the image, and that the crop gets created automatically based on where your focal point is as a crosshair. Yeah, and and we didn't use it in our case because we're doing it in CSS based on the browser's aspect ratio. So we can't have Drupal yeah. crop the image. We need to actually deliver the That's whole image. Cool. Okay. So, but yeah, focal point. So that is the end. Find me at the after party if you want to learn about Kint or any more of this. Enjoy your day.